Hi, I'm Dr. Nancy Van Wagener. I'm a professor of geology at Thompson Rivers University. And today I'm going to talk about the Eocene volcanism of South Central British Columbia. I want to take you on a field trip, but before we go, I'd like to provide you with some context for what we're going to see. The rocks we're going to see are roughly 50 million years old, part of the Eocene epoch, bracketed by the red arrows. That might seem ancient, but Earth is 4.6 billion years old. If we compressed all of geologic time into one calendar year, the Eocene epoch would have started on the fifth day before the end of the year. The beginning of the Eocene is marked by a spike in global climate called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, shown in the graph on the left, followed by the early Eocene Climatic Optimum, roughly about the same age or time as the rocks we are going to be looking at. Global volcanism may have contributed to these climatic excursions, and that is a source of discussion among geologists. The end of the Eocene, and I'm sorry to say that most geologic epochs don't end well, was marked by an extinction event, shown at the red arrow on the graph on the right. The rocks we're going to be looking at are part of an extensive belt of Eocene volcanics, shown in green on this location map and our area is part of the southern Kamloops Chalice Belt, indicated by the red area, and we're working in south-central BC, but the belt extends all the way down to Idaho. I wish to acknowledge that the TRU campus and the area we'll be visiting today are located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Tekeplapastache Equipment, and I'm grateful for their generosity and hospitality while we live, learn, and work here. Now, why there is such extensive volcanism is a source of controversy among geologists, but there is geochemical and geophysical evidence to support the idea that volcanism is related to what is called a slab window, or a gap in subducting plates, as shown on this diagram that gives a three-dimensional view into Earth. This, along with faulting due to the reorganization of plates, resulted in a series of basins that formed the locus of volcanism. The others have and continue to work in the area, but the most detailed geologic mapping was done by Thomas Ewing in 1981, and we're building on his excellent and comprehensive work. Today, we're visiting the areas shown in the blue squares. We're addressing a number of questions with our research, but today I wanted to focus on the physical characteristics of volcanism because I think you'll find it the most interesting and applicable to your daily outings wherever you are on the planet. Besides, I really wanted to take you on a field trip. So enough chit chat, let's get going. Welcome to my research area. I know this doesn't look much like a volcano, but I hope that during this presentation, I'll give you a different way of looking at this part of the world. So please, come with me. We're gonna start our field trip on the other side of the valley, way past the smokestack by the university at Kenna Cartwright Park. And then, finish up over here. Kenneth Cartwright Park, and I just love this park. It covers 800 hectares, making it one of the largest, if not the largest, municipal park in the province of British Columbia. It also has 40 kilometers of hiking trails, which will take us through the Eocene volcanics that we're interested in for this research project. So let's go look at the rocks. The other reason I love this park is because we have some elevation change. So we can go from the older volcanic rocks at the bottom to the younger volcanic rocks at the top and in that way unfold the story of the evolution of this volcanic area. This is where I would usually start a field trip at Kenneth Cartwright Park and you can see that we take physical distancing very seriously. Okay, a little bit of intro geology before we get started. We're in an area of igneous rocks. So there are two main types of igneous rocks. Igneous rocks solidify from a, a red hot melt. There are intrusive igneous rocks which cool within the earth. 
forming something like a pluton or a dike and extrusive igneous rocks which which cool on the surface of the earth forming something like a lava flow there's a feeder dike and a lava flow which we'll see on our field trip and the main compositional types of extrusive igneous rocks are basalt which is very dark in color usually andesite which is in between and then rhyolite which tends to be lighter in color and the main compositional difference has to do with the amount of silicon and oxygen or silicon dioxide that makes up each of these rock types and the ones in the Kenna Cartwright Park area are called basaltic andesites their compositional type resides in here but I can actually tell that by looking at the rocks in the field but um, but I also have t took a number of samples from that area and we crush them up and run them through a mass spectrometer and that gives us the exact composition of those rocks down to the parts per million and parts per billion depending upon what elements we're looking at. So let's go and now we'll look at the rocks. All right, here we are, the Sunny Side Trail. We started out down here at the parking lot and we're right here now and our journey is going to take us up the sunny side trail we're primarily going to be walking uphill remember that means that we're going from older rocks uphill to younger rocks and we're going to end up on the other side of the park at lava lookout first stop is actually going to be at the basaltic andesite columnar joints or columns columnar joints form as lava cools and contracts they tend to form so that the long axis of the column is perpendicular to a flow top, as exemplified by the spectacular flows exposed in Coca Canyon in Peru, and perpendicular to a dike margin, as shown in the example on the right. Great, here we are. This is our first stop, and this is a pile of igneous rock. And my job is, I guess our job, because we're on this field trip together, is to try and figure out whether this is a flow or a dike. And um, one of the things that I notice in here, and you have to use really careful eyes, is that I can see some of those columnar joints that we talked about earlier. And let's see if I can help you see them as well. I don't think this is graffiti because I think this is going to wash off. This is just regular chalk and I can outline this and as I mentioned earlier as I mentioned earlier these things form so that they're perpendicular to um, to cooling fronts or to to the chill margins of the flow or the dike so if it was a flow I happen to bring one of these with me from our lab so if it was a flow you would see them in here like this but you'll notice that we're seeing them in here like that. I'm pretty sure this is a dike and there was a margin over here that's been eroded away and one over there. Looks pretty quiet, looks pretty uh, calm right now, but let's have a look at some video from Hawaii and see what it looked like when it was forming. Lava is coming up through a fissure. When the eruption stops, a dike will remain in the subsurface. So where are we? This looks like a pile of isolated dirt. And I'm gonna go up there and grab a sample and we'll have a look at it and uh, talk about how this isolated pile of dirt might have formed. Doesn't look volcanic at all, does it? It looks kind of sticky like clay. And oops, the, the way I think this formed, was that there was a, I'll put, so put the clay down. Talk about why it's clay in a moment. So if you can imagine, we're, we're in a map view now, so it's like we're looking down. And this is a lake shore.
And this is the water out here from a lake. And this is a lava flow going this way. And it's hot. This is around 1200 degrees centigrade. So what happens when it enters, the, when it contacts with the water, is it undergoes a thermal contraction and it smashes to smithereens, putting a bunch of fine-grained, glassy volcanic particles into the air that then accumulate as what we would call a tough cone. And that's why it's an isolated deposit here. That glass is not very stable. And so it quickly alters to clays, like what you see here. This is really sticky. I mean, we could do, we could do arts and crafts with this stuff. All right, so to really work this out, we've got to go up near the top and, uh, and get a very good sample, run some size and shape experiments on the individual fragments and run it through our new uh, scanning electron microscope to look at the composition and texture of the grains, which was a very excellent um, undergraduate student research project. But for now, when I look at this rock, this pile of dirt, this is what I see in my mind. We're coming to a red hot lava flow entering the sea off the coast of Hawaii. Notice how the thermal quenching is spewing those particles, breaking that lava up and spewing those particles into the air. Well, under the right condition, those particles might accumulate as a tough cone, like this small littoral cone that's off the coast of Hawaii, or these vegetated littoral tough cones that surround Lake Mivatan in Iceland. Why This stuff is so sticky and so slimy and so messy. All right, well, this is a really interesting outcrop that tells another piece of the volcanic story for this area. What I'd like you to know, notice uh, is that there's a vague kind of layering in this rock going like this. You might have to squint your eyes to really trust me on that. And if you want to come a little closer, I'll show you the texture that's particularly distinctive about this type of deposit. I call this texture a hyaloclastite, and it's formed when lava encounters water and it breaks up and you can see that there's a kind of coherent flow lobe here and then all it's surrounded by all this brecciation and these and it hasn't gone very far and it's very and it, the fragments are regular angular they all kind of fit together as though this thing this lobe just entered the water that caused the fragmentation and and broke up how's that forms a number of ways you can form that kind of hyaloclastite. It requires an interaction of hot, hot lava with water. And in this particular case, where we notice this kind of bedding that I showed you before, that kind of vague bedding, it forms on a volcanic delta. So this is the land over here. By the way, I took this image from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory in, the, um, in this part of the U.S. Geological Survey. So the lava flows from here, I'll get my hand out of the way, flows from here and it hits the water and it breaks up. And you can see these lobes kind of extend down like this off, off the coast into the water and they break up. And that's what the, that white area is showing is all that fragmentation. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Now that I've come off that hillside, I just wanted to say a little bit more about this diagram because it's going to be important later on. Every progressive flow that comes, that comes from the land prograts out over the over the hyaloclastite that was deposited before and that builds out more land into the water in our case this would have been this would have been a lake and um, and so in in this way we're creating uh, more of a subaerial environment I think we've got a pretty good sun angle here for you to see a very good example of this hyaloclastite you can imagine how, look at all these angular fragments and you can imagine how something a texture like this might form if you had a very like red hot glass and you put it into a bucket of ice water it would fragment into all these angular pieces which is just exactly what you see here when i look at this outcrop what i see in my mind's eye is this
We're flying over a newly formed volcanic delta. The darker flows that you can see on the top of the delta are the most recent. These features are very unstable. They're prone to landslides and also destruction by wave erosion. So I don't recommend putting your vacation home right there. Not everything in this park is volcanic. In fact, this sediment was deposited by a, a glacier about 10,000 years ago. Glaciers can carry large pieces of rock very great distances. And so when you look at this hillside, you'll notice that there are a lot of, without even paying attention to what types of rocks they are, you can notice that there are different colors of rocks. And they come from different places in the province brought here by a glacier. I've got everything from this really big angular granodiorite to some you know, metamorphic rocks. This is a real, this is a nice, that's a really high grade metamorphic rock. The point I would like you to ponder for a moment is that these, this sediment was deposited about 10,000 years ago. Volcanic rocks that we just walked past were deposited 50 million years ago. No other ages of rocks that we know of yet in this park. So we're missing 49.9 million years of earth history when you see this think this this is a really different type of flow facies and you're going to have to use your geo eyes to be able to see this one you have to look carefully and you'll see these dark bands surrounding the darker material. These are individual pohoihoi toes that formed at the distal end of an anastomosing flow, like this. I'm going to take you on uh, Lowdown Alley to see a different type of volcanic feature that we haven't seen yet. And this must be the way to go because somebody put a rock on top of the trail sign. Let's go. Turn to the north at Lava Flow Lookout because if you keep going down Blowdown Alley, it looks just like Blowdown Alley. Most of the flows we have in the park are what we call Pahoehoe flows, which have a very smooth, ropey looking surface. They flow by forming lobes, somewhat like you see here. The lobes cool on the outside, but they're still full of hot lava on the inside, which breaks open the lobe and flows away, leaving behind a lava tube. I'm gonna show you a video from Hawaii of a flow that's very similar to this. And if you pay attention, Near the end of the video, you'll see a feature that is almost identical. Lava Flow Lookout, and it's one of my favorite places in the park. I actually think they're all my favorite places in the park. We're standing here on top of a series of very thick lava flows. It's called a lava flow field. I just 
love for you to have a look at this vista. For one thing, it's beautiful. It's looking out at Kamloops Lake, We've got the sewage treatment plant sort of on the left, the airport over on the right. From here, we're looking down on a lava field. It's one thick flow on top of the other with no indication for any interaction with water. So clearly by the time we're here, we build up above the water, the level of the lake, and it's a completely subaerial environment. So I'm just gonna walk down just below me and we'll look at one of these lava flows in cross section. Each one of these ledges marks the top of a flow. So I'm standing on top of one flow and walking up through another flow. There's the top. So when we do our mapping, we map on a map base, and this time where you're using these aerial photographs from the city, you can actually go on the city website and download these yourself. We were standing about right here, and each one of these ledges marks the top of another flow. And I wanted to show you one other really cool thing from this map. Remember I talked about Pohoihoi flows having these real ropey surfaces? If you look really closely, you can see that those are actually preserved in these 50 million year old flows. So if we were to do, to do a study, which we could be a great study for an undergraduate student project, we can map those flow bands and figure out the direction, follow that backwards to the vent area. To better visualize what you're seeing here, have a look at this sequence of thick flows from Iceland. We're going to make one more stop over where we started and then it will be time to wrap things up. We're in Lac de Bois Grasslands Provincial Park. Behind me, you can see a tabular, dark tabular unit. That's a dike that's intruded into those layers of volcanic classic rock that make up the famous Kamloops hoodoos. We're going to be going down there and have a look at that interesting outcrop. Go. Hey, we're at the outcrop I pointed out previously, and it looks kind of like a stack of volcanic or basaltic pillows, and it's actually called a pillow flow. And this is one of the many features that form when a lava flow encounters water or a lava flow starts and flows underwater. You can see these nice sort of bulbous forms like this one here, this one, and the one up above my head. As the flow moves into the water, it chills, making an all around, sort of making a, a ball shape. And then as the lava pushes through that ball, it breaks open and forms another bud. And that's what forms these large bulbous forms. Let's have a look at one of these flows forming in action. This is another great exposure of these pillow flows. You can see one here. Another very one down here. So this is a clear indication that when these rocks were deposited, this area was underwater. I hope you enjoyed the field trip. Let's go back to the lab and I'll wrap things up. We've covered a lot on this field trip and I'd like to leave you with a picture you can hold on to. So let's do a little recap. In the big picture, volcanism was concentrated in fault block basins shown by the blue rectangles in a back arc tectonic setting related to subduction and a slab window. There are a variety of rock units in our area and they're not laterally extensive, forming a complex geometry that was further complicated by deformation during and after volcanism. For now, 
We can use what we saw in the field to construct a conceptual picture for the volcanism we observed, beginning with a lake in a faulted basin, filling with sediments and volcanic tufts that were shed from the margin of the basins and from volcanic eruptions. Lava flows fed by nearby fissures flowed into the lake, forming a delta and littoral cones along the shoreline. As the delta grew, the deltaic material and lava flows filled the lake, resulting in the lava flow field we saw at the lookout. Subsequently, the area was carved by glaciers, so the topography we're seeing now is certainly very different from what it was in the Eocene. So if we could go back to the Eocene, our area might have looked something like this. I'm showing a pyroclastic cone in the background and lava flows in the foreground from a back arc setting in Argentina. This is just a part of my ongoing research program. Detailed geochemical studies will take us deep into the source of the volcanism, helping to create a clear picture of the volcanism of South Central British Columbia and its significance to unraveling some of the big picture questions. Now, if you want to find out more, all of the video of active volcanism is in the public domain, courtesy of the U.S. Geological Survey and NOAA. The graphics I used are also freely accessible, and I want to point your attention to Steve Earle's great geology textbook that's listed at the top, which is available for free as part of BC Open Campus. For more technical reading, these are the resources I used in preparing this presentation. Well, that's been quite a journey. I'd like to thank my students and Jim Britton, our regional geologist, now retired, who joined us in the field, and acknowledge Jesse Thompson and Matt Miller, who did particularly successful research projects in the area. A special thank you to Steve Van Wagner, my volunteer videographer, and to Dana Buck in the research office. Thanks for the opportunity to share my research, and to Samuel Agin and Joseph McGarry and the folks at Marcom for putting this together, and to my colleagues in the Physical Sciences Department. If you found this interesting and you would like to continue your education in a more formal way, we are offering a number of courses in geology during the fall and winter term, and, uh, you know, you can take these for credit or you can take them as an audit. And because we're doing remote teaching, you can access these geology courses from anywhere in the world. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or you would like to be in touch about other presentations, please feel free to send me an email. Thanks for coming. See you next time. These cliff faces, it doesn't look like a cliff face, does it? Can you see? Now we're the back end of the park, we're the north side, going up Blow Me Down Alley. Up Blow Down Alley. Okay. Okay. <laughs>